any other information that's given to you and it may even stop you from trying some of the things that have been suggested to you like change of diet like losing weight like exercise like taking hormone replacements like I don't know or any and all of the things that might actually have a direct and satisfactory result for you welcome to get pregnant naturally where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark. My mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm excited to welcome Diana Rickman to the podcast, and we're digging into emotional freedom technique, or EFT, also known as tapping, and how it can help with the pain of miscarriage, traumatic birth, and helping with stress as well. Diana Rickman is a coach and emotional freedom technique practitioner specializing in helping women and their partners who have experienced an early miscarriage or difficult birth to change how they feel about their painful memories and the way that this story affects them now so they can think about what happened calmly, grieve fully, and feel ready to move on and create a new story. Diana is in a unique position to help because she experienced both the loss of her ba first baby at 25 weeks and her second pregnancy ended in a difficult emergency delivery of her son. Her experiences left her shocked and unable to express how she felt. She carried feelings of guilt, anger, and sadness for a long time, and they influenced her thinking and the way she felt about herself. Thankfully, she found a technique she could rely on to support her and coach her, and a coach who gently and expertly helped her to understand and release her feelings safely and without overwhelm. Now she shares with this technique with her clients so they can experience the same sense of relief and freedom from loss and hurt that she, she experienced. Check out her website at yourpregnancystory.com. That's yourpregnancystory.com. And before we jump on today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Diana, welcome to the podcast. Excited you're here. Me, it's my pleasure. Yeah, awesome. So we're going to dig into EFT, emotional freedom technique today. So and before we do that, maybe just yeah, share with us your, your story and how you came to do this work. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm happy to do that. That's a um, long time ago now, back in 2001. My husband and I moved with the children for a gap year to New Zealand and I got homesick very quickly, very badly homesick and was looking for a way to try and relieve some of the symptoms and I just came across emotional freedom technique. I mean, it's, a, it's quite a long story about how I did, but that's basically how I found out about this technique and what it is, is a very simple way that you can use acupressure on yourself along with language patterns to um, just alleviate the way you're feeling. And so I used it for the homesickness and got some really great results. I thought this was an amazing tool. I mean, it's quite a wacky thing to do, but mm -hmm. it seemed to work. So I became more and more interested in it and I could see how I could use it within the work I was doing. So I've worked for a long time, since, since my children were born anyway, I've worked in support roles. So helping children at school, usually children who have learning difficulties of one sort or another. And so I could see that this could really help me when I was working with these children and also the children just to keep calm to to keep be present when you're working with them so that you don't bring your own needs or ego into it you know and so I, I kept working and adapting with the process of EFT and using it in a surrogate way I'm also um, a teacher of English as a foreign language and I found that so often especially new migrants and refugees they they would be missing family and home much more than they wanted to conjugate verbs. And so I could help them use this technique just as I had for homesickness to just help them feel a bit more relaxed, to understand and process those feelings of grief and loss that they had about moving to a new culture and a long way from home. And so that's, that's really in a nutshell how I got into it. And eventually I just, enjoyed the process so much I'd learned so much about it that in 2015 I decided to quit my job and set up a practice full-time um, and at that point I'd been working closely with a colleague who is a doula and also runs antenatal classes I don't know if you you know what a doula is it's um, mm -hmm. 
just for those people who don't, it's somebody who goes into the home of a new mother and is is more than a, a not really a nanny. So they're not there to look after the baby. They're there to look after mum in whatever way mum wants, so that mum can bond really well and quickly with the baby and has time. Um, whether they've had a difficult birth or not, it's just being there for mum. And so she would work with women who'd had particularly difficult births or some, something had happened perhaps um, as an emergency towards the end. You know, they had a great pregnancy and then the delivery had been quite frightening and traumatic. Mm -hmm. Or she also worked with women who had had multiple miscarriages before carrying a baby to term and delivering a healthy baby but they were finding the block of the miscarriages were getting in the way of this relationship with this new little being that they had. And so I started working at the practice that um, she'd set up, helping women and their partners come to terms with miscarriage and also difficult births. And I found I had a passion for that and was in a in something of a unique position to do that because I'd experienced both an, a miscarriage at 25 weeks and then also my son, although the pregnancy had gone well, his delivery was um, an emergency delivery and again it was very frightening and we almost lost him and as a result of that I got stuck or frozen in that trauma even though I went forward from there and, <clears throat> excuse me, we had um, another baby, my daughter, that all went very well. And the delivery actually was very, was a wonderful delivery for my daughter. I still couldn't get rid of this sense of the baby I lost and all of the grief that I wasn't expressing about that. And then the trauma of the delivery of my son. And so, yeah, that's what I've been doing now for the last um three nearly four years is working with women and their partners helping them with with the same situation that I found myself in all that time ago yeah I think it's amazing how you kind of organically end up coming to these sorts of things and then it's like oh wait a minute it's something that you had experienced yourself and somehow you were placed there <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but isn't it always the case do you it think is. oh yes it is <laughs> So let's, um, and yeah, as part of our, our couples coaching program, we include um, Brandy, the uh, functional diagnostic practitioner that we work with that's on my team. She, um, she's an emotional uh, freedom technique practitioner as well. And so we include in the uh, couples coaching program, we include a 60 minute EFT session. So we definitely believe in the power of emotional freedom technique, but let's, uh, let's have you explain it. And yeah, what exactly is it? Cause people kind of think, Oh, tapping, this seems a little bit, is it even doing anything? it seems kind of silly you know what exactly is it yeah yeah well yeah I and I agree I mean it looks wacky and my first reaction to it was um how can this ridiculous thing even work but somehow I felt drawn to it to to explore it further so it really it's scientifically verified approach to supporting people so scientifically verified because it has been through clinical trials for various that applications and really what it does is helps you on a number of levels so the tapping is activating meridian endpoints which are the same parts of the body that are used for reflexology or acupressure or acupuncture so it's it's tying in with that ancient meridian system mapped by the Chinese and why does it work because these meridians or these endpoints of the meridians for some reason that's still not completely known, have a direct link through to parts of our brain. And in particular, the part of our brain that's very primitive, the part that gets us to react for fight or flight. And so it's very good at calming and setting up a balance. And what happens when we get calm is our brain releases um, endorphins and other feel-good hormones that counteract things like cortisol and adrenaline. So it's good for our bodies as well because it's helping to keep down those fight or flight hormones, the chemicals that we need, which long-term are what lead to those stress-related illnesses, things like the shakes and then palpitations, tight chest, stomach problems. They, they're all coming about as a result of being in a state of stress all the time. So EFT is very good, just on a very simple level of keeping you balanced. When you take it to a further level, you combine it with um, language patterns. So some people will recognize it as being a bit like cognitive behavior therapy. There are elements of that in it. There are also elements of neurolinguistic programming language in there. 
And effectively what you're doing is you're taking the thoughts that are expressed as feelings and helping to separate the two so that the thought, you can see the thought in its entirety and for what it actually means. And so let's take a very simple thought, I'm stupid. Well, if you're in the moment and you've done something wrong and you're embarrassed, you feel stupid, does that mean you are stupid? And if you start to explore that and tap on I am stupid very quickly, your brain will start to fight back against that. It's, it's not true. I'm not always stupid. I may have done something silly now. You know, so the, the, way, the way you use the language is important as well. And it's very important to always start off with exactly how you feel, exactly what you're saying about yourself or all the hurtful thing or, or um, action that was done to you. And then you start exploring it. And so it takes the sting out because it removes the emotion from the thought and the words. Yeah, and I guess it's important to bring up the, the negative emotion because if you're to tap, which sometimes can even be hard for us to even bring that to the surface and say what, what that is, because it might feel yeah. like even, yeah, it's something that's just going around in our mind and bring saying that out loud um, what, yeah, what if someone has a hard time even articulating what it is? How can they yes. be able to honor the wound as we talk about it? Yeah, so it doesn't matter if you haven't got the words or you don't want to use the words. You know, you, you may, it may be too painful at that point to say exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But the thoughts in your head, whether you're, whether you're articulating it in words, the thought is still there. And so in that case, the tapping and breathing at the same time. And I mean, we all know how important breathing is, but using breath in a very um, prescriptive way so that, and obviously you have to do this within your own capabilities. So if you have um, things like asthma or other breathing difficulties, but if you can manage a sort of a yoga breath, and that would be really deep breathing in and trying to take the breath down to um, the top of your stomach rather than that chest breathing that we all do when we're very stressed. Mm -hmm. And to try and achieve that, often it's good if you can lie down or just sit quietly. But try and breathe in for a count of about five. And then you breathe out for a count of about five. And you, you'll have to build on this. And I say sit down because when you're starting, it can make you feel a bit lightheaded. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're trying to breathe in that way in a very, not, not in a normal way, if you like. It's a very prescriptive way. And you would tap at the same time. And this is something I get almost all of my clients to do when they start working with me is that before they do anything else, before they think about any problems they have, they know what's troubling them. They don't have to say it, but they tap and breathe every time the feeling associated with this problem comes up. So let's say you're remem remembering something unpleasant. And when you do, you get a tight chest. So you know that tight chest is to do with this thought. So you could just tap and breathe and you would tap on all the tapping points which we can go through perhaps later on as we talk mm -hmm. but you tap on and as you reach each tapping point you just do that breath that five in five out and the breath out instead of thinking about um blowing out candles think about steaming up a glass so it really is a very cathartic breath out and again all the way around and you can do that as many times as you like and the breath helps to bring some balance in, as well as the tapping. So you've not cured the problem, you've not sent it away, you've not, you're going to think about it again later. But in that moment, what you're doing is starting to tell your brain, even though I've thought about this thing and it makes me feel bad, I'm okay, I'm safe. Because when you're breathing in that way, your brain knows that you're not running from a predator. You, you don't need to be in fight or flight. You're having that bad memory that puts you in that fight or flight reaction. But actually, if you're having that memory whilst you're sitting watching the television or, or walk, going for a walk or wherever you are, and you're not actually in any danger at all of that thing happening to you again or any other thing happening, then that breath tells your brain instantly, actually, I'm safe, I'm okay. And so you're more quickly able to manage the stress response. And bit by bit, you start retraining yourself and therefore your brain that you can take hold of this, that you can cope with this, even though it's a terrible memory, you can cope with this. So 
just to clarify, if there is a terrible, if there's a traumatic birth, this case or miscarriage, and not being able to, to even though we're, there's there's that thought that's going, you know, they usually this 99% of the thoughts you have, you have the same ones again today yeah. and then the next day. But if you're not able to, I'm just trying to figure this out to, as far as it works with saying it out loud. You say you don't need to say that that thought out loud. So I thought you did. You don't need to say it. Okay. No, you okay. don't need to say it. Fun. It's you know what you're worried about. It's in your head already. And if it's too difficult to say it, why why push through it? This is mm-hmm. a this is a very gentle technique. This is not about white knuckle riding anything. Um, I can tell you, Sarah, that I've worked with two clients now, and saw both of them for six weeks. And in both cases, I never really knew what the cause of the problem was for them. I I knew they had a traumatic event and they never really wanted to tell the story, but they were able to work through the story and we worked through it together bit by bit. So I never knew the full story. I never, you know, I couldn't actually tell you this is what happened to them and this is why they felt this way. And I don't need to, I don't need to, this is the difference I think. And often people um, find this a bit challenging at first if they've come through a lot of counseling where you very often will go in and you will talk about what happened, sometimes over and over. But with emotional freedom technique, what we do is we focus on the feelings and we focus on the parts of the story, sometimes just one part of the story. And it might be that the whole thing went on for 20 minutes But the bit that really caused the traumatic response was the look on somebody's face when they delivered the news. And so we would just work on the look on their face. And when you get rid of the emotional attachment to the look on their face, sometimes what happens is people reframe it and they say, well, actually, perhaps he didn't look angry. Perhaps perhaps he was looking worried when I think about it now. So what happens is you start to be able to bring some wisdom into what happened. So really, I mean, I'm, I'm going off a tangent here, but the, the answer is, if it's too painful to talk about, even to yourself, you don't want to say the words for whatever reason, mm-hmm. don't say them. Don't say them. Just tap and breathe, tap and breathe. The next step would be, even though I don't want to talk about this, I'm okay right now. So that would be your setup mm-hmm. statement as you tap. And when we have, what a setup statement does is it really just sets the intention for why you're doing this. You know, why, why have I sat down here to tap? I've sat down here to tap because I've got this bad memory in my head. I don't want to talk about it to anybody. And it's really making me feel bad today. But I'm safe right now. And you're safe right now because you're sitting in, in your sitting room, on your sofa or wherever you are. Yeah, so that's the, that is the truth at that point. You didn't feel safe when the bad thing happened. But right now in this moment, you are safe. And so... That talks to your subconscious that says, we can handle this because right now you're safe. Yes, this is a terrible memory. Right now you're safe. And so you tap around with, I don't want to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about this. I don't want to think about this, but it's in my head anyway. And you might just keep tapping around with sentences along those lines. So you haven't talked about what happened. You haven't mentioned names. You haven't, you haven't really dived in but you've still addressed the problem. The problem is I've got this terrible thing that happened and I can't even talk about it. And even that makes me feel bad or silly or I need to talk about it. I should talk about it, you know? So yeah, there's, there are so many ways that you can approach this and you do it gently. Mm-hmm. And I I just recently was at a Gabrielle Bernstein workshop and uh, read her book, The Judgment Detox, which goes through a number of different steps, including EFT and praying. And I think she's got five or six steps in this process of hers. So it's yeah, honoring the 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 wound through EFT and and using all these yeah, using using the, the the techniques to bring that to the surface. And as you say, it can be brought to the surface, I guess, either through saying it out loud or 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 not depending yeah, on depending yeah. on where the person is exactly i mean it, there's a lot of healing to be had through just sobbing your heart out and tapping at the same time mm-hmm. you know so if if that's all you're managing to do at the moment is cry then cry but tap as you cry because what you'll do as you tap although you're expressing yourself in the way that you need to right now there's nothing wrong with crying but the tapping will help it go from a, a perhaps take away the overwhelm that comes with the crying. You know, the, the sense of I can't control this. 
I'm, and I'm out of control. So if you tap at the same time, you're just going to get that balance come in. But yeah, tapping and crying, it's, it's, it's wonderfully cathartic and it's to be recommended too. So, you know, don't you, you go with where you are right now. And that's, that's the, the biggest message I give to anybody who works with me. Whatever you're ready to do right now, this is not about white knuckle riding, that terrible memory. Mm-hmm. And often traditional counseling can feel a bit like that, that you just keep telling the story. And in a way that's re-traumatizing you over and over because there's no resolution. And so one of the key things with emotional freedom technique is it allows you, my client, to come up with a resolution for the problem. That doesn't mean it makes the problem go away or that you forget. It doesn't mean you have to let anybody off the hook if they behaved badly, but it helps you, your brain, make sense of what happened in a way that feels comfortable to you. Yeah, absolutely. In, in this workshop with, with Gabrielle, we had, there was 900 people in there and she had, she led a number of people, maybe two or three through the EFT process and they would start out, you know, whatever it was, it was a traumatic thing and they were at a 10. And then mm-hmm. as she led them through the tapping process, sometimes, you know, three and four rounds was able to get the person down to zero where they weren't triggered by it. Yeah. Or in the beginning they yeah. were, you know, on fire. Yeah. Now, I think I have to, to um, give a little, um, a little bit of a proviso with this. Now, one of the things that I did when I first started using emotional freedom technique is I used it brilliantly to bring down the feelings so that I think I, did, I thought I didn't have a problem anymore. And then what would happen is I'd be re-triggered. Something would happen. I'd see something. I'd read something. Somebody would say something and I'd be like, whoop, off again, back up to a 10. And I thought, well, that's weird. This thing's not working. But what I hadn't realized was I was very good at putting a lid on. So it was almost like I put a blanket on it and then I put something on top of the blanket and, you know, it was all, but the problem was still under there. It's like hiding a mess. Um, If you've got teenagers, you'll get this, you know, it's tidying your room by putting everything under the quilt and then throwing that on top, you know? So it's the same thing. Eventually the mess has to be put away into the right places. If you want to have, have clarity and really feel like you have made sense of what's happened. And so for me, the real healing and the, um, the release came when I applied EFT to the stories and the beliefs that I had around that, the beliefs that I, I was wrong, that I'd done something wrong, that I was a bad person, that I wasn't deserving. You know, all of the things that I believed that I didn't even know I believed. And then the anger that I had towards other people in the story, again, that I wasn't admitting, why would I be angry towards them? They were very kind, they'd help me. And the comments that people had made, sometimes very simple comments, but at the wrong time. And so the comment had had been almost like somebody blowing a foghorn in my face, you know? So it's about just working slowly through everything and being careful that even if you put the, the lid on for the time being, because sometimes that's what you need. You just need to get calm and quiet so that you can start thinking about what do you want to work on first, but you do have to then take the next step. And that's, and a lot of my work is about testing. It's about testing that, that what somebody says to me no longer troubles them really is the case. And so the next week I would say, and so when you think about that thing, we, we might go in a bit deeper and I might in the end become quite provocative in trying to make sure that that memory is no longer going to be something that can come back and trip you up. Yeah. That, that, those triggers and so many people dealing with going through, you know, fertility challenges, there's triggers everywhere. Yeah. Which that's why we've, yeah, we we find EFT so powerful for this. Absolutely. Um, Maybe things like smell of the hospital and all sorts, won't it? You know, for everybody, mm -hmm. it'd be different. Mm Mm-hmm. So are you able to run us through a a demo as to if someone was feeling, maybe we can go, whatever, if you think it's better, either jealous or anxious and how that would look for, for tapping if we were, we can go through. Yeah. So actually the emotion doesn't really matter. You'd use the same approach for whichever emotion it is. So whatever you're feeling, if you've identified the emotion or if you haven't, this is the other thing. It's sometimes quite sneaky and the sneaky ones are anger and um, feelings about ourselves. You know, jealousy is another one that comes up. Mm -hmm. We don't like to admit to being jealous or envious. We don't like to admit to being angry. And often that's because 
from very young, we've been told that's not a nice way to be. Partic particularly women, you know, expressing anger. Certainly from my generation, you know, you have to be a nice, good girl. And so any of those more um, sticky emotions, you know, there's those ones, the, the bad girl emotions, if you like, mm -hmm. um, they can be hidden behind other things. And I find overwhelm is often either sadness hiding underneath it or anger. So I would say whenever you're doing this, just be kind to yourself and be open that whatever comes up is what needs to come up, is what needs to come out. And it doesn't make you a bad person that you're suddenly feeling very angry, but that can be quite frightening for people to suddenly feel so very angry. So if you know what the emotion is to start with, then great, let's name it. And you'd start by tapping and tapping is using the fingertips of one hand. It doesn't matter which way round you do this, which hand taps where, but you take the fingertips of one hand. So I'm right-handed. I like to tap the fingertips of my right hand onto the side of my left hand. And that's the side that runs down on your palm and it runs down from your little finger. So that fleshy bit at the side. Kind of the karate and, chop thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So if you tap on that point there, that side of the hand point, and you want to tap not too slowly. So let's think if you're tapping, it would be like tap, 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 tap. So it's, it's a bit faster than a heartbeat, but not too fast. And you tap as you talk about either out loud or in your head. Better if you can say it out loud, but if you can't, if, if you need privacy, um, then it doesn't matter. And you'd say, even though I'm feeling whatever the emotion is, so let's go with anger, shall we? Even mm. though I'm feeling angry. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend I don't know why I'm feeling angry. I just got all this anger in me. I've got all this anger in me. And it's to do with what happened. And I don't know why I feel angry. I'm okay right now. Now, I'm going to just stop for a minute there. If you look at a lot of EFT being demonstrated on the internet, you'll see, especially on YouTube, You'll see the setup phrase often people say, I deeply love and accept myself. Right. My experience of this is that people, the people I've worked with, the clients I work with, when they first come to me, they cannot deeply love and accept themselves for feeling like this. You know, they're having enough trouble deeply loving and accepting other people, let alone themselves. For some people, the setup phrase, the phrase has been, and I came here today. Even though I had this terrible problem, I came here today. So it's, you meet yourself wherever you are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So even though I have all this anger, I'm so angry and I don't know why. And that's to do with what happened to me. I'm okay right now. And then the next tapping point is on the top of the head. Now, again, I might do it in a different order to what you've seen. This is just the way mm -hmm. I, I do it. Top of the head is just back from where the fontanelle is on a baby. So you're just tapping back from there. Use four three or four fingers, again, doesn't matter what hand, or you can use both hands. All this anger in my body is what you would say as you tap there. And then the next tapping point is between the eyebrows, where a mono brow would be. Two, three fingers, two hands if you want to, doesn't matter which hand. All this anger in my body, side of the eye, I'm so angry. Now the side of the eye point is where um, laughter lines are. The next point is under the eye, and that's about a centimeter along from the tear duct and then down on the eye socket. And then, and so you tap on the under arm eye point. So just use a couple of fingers for that, just gently. And the next point is under the nose, and that's on the dip, just above your lip, just under your nose. Again, two fingers is probably enough for that point. And every time you're tapping on a point, you're just expressing this anger. I feel angry all this anger in my body. I am so angry. This next point under the lip, just where the crease of your chin is. I'm so very angry. And then you can finish up on the chest point. And the best way to get the chest point really is to spread your hand out flat and just tap along the line of where your collarbones are, just maybe just under. Now there's also a tapping point under the arm and that's mm -hmm. for a man it's in line with the nipple. For a woman, it's straight down from the armpit where your bra strap sits. Not everybody likes that point, but you can put that one in as well. And 
what I do with clients, it depends on what I often find is they don't like one of the points, they'll, they'll shy away from it. So if you're finding any of those points feel uncomfortable, then go back to the side of the hand point just to finish off. So I guess the other important thing here is that whatever recipe you've seen for tapping, whatever points you've seen people tapping on, it doesn't matter, firstly, if you miss a point out or if you get them in the wrong order. I only do it in that order because it sort of makes logical sense. You're sort of going around in a circle or falling down the body, if you like. Men I work with often like to tap on their legs. They like to tap just by their knee on the outside of the leg. So we have loads and loads of acupressure points that we can use. The, the thing with emotional freedom technique, Gary Craig, the man who developed it, took the um, original Dr. Roger Callahan's thought field therapy and he just fine tuned some of the tapping points. So don't get hung up about missing points or, or using the same point or getting it in the wrong order. The, the, the important thing here is that you just express how you're feeling. So we've done one round, I am angry stating it. I'm feeling angry and I've got anger in my body. Where is this anger? It's in my body. The next step now to go around again. So we're back to the top of the head point. Where is this anger? So I'm going to pretend I'm feeling this anger as a tightness across my shoulders. My shoulders are so tight. All this anger, my shoulders are tight between the eyebrows. I feel so angry. Side of the eye. This tightness in my shoulders under the eye. I feel so tight under the nose. I'm angry under the mouth. I feel so tight and angry. Collarbone point. This tightness in my shoulders. Back to the side of the hand. Oh, this tightness in my shoulders and this anger. So you see how I'm building here. I'm, as I'm tapping, I'm noticing what I'm feeling and where this anger is manifesting. Now, we're talking about anger. It could be something else. It could be sadness. It could be sadness and a deep crushing feeling in your chest. And we build and we build and we build. And for some people, that might be enough just to do those two things. It will put a lid on. It's acknowledging. It's accepting. You've said, I've got this feeling and it's to do with this emotion, but I'm okay. A very effective way of using EFT, particularly when you're working on your own, is to use colors or shapes to help to help name and identify the way you're feeling so a good question to ask yourself particularly if you're not sure what the emotion is you just feel bad you just don't feel good and you're tearful and you're overwhelmed but you don't know what's driving it is to say to yourself what color is this feeling and you'd be surprised that a color will come to you and then where is this feeling in my body? And if this feeling had a shape, what would it be? And again, it always amazes my clients. They, they say, I cannot believe that this feeling is a square, red, pulsating thing. You know, mm -hmm. this, this becomes a bit, you know, but what it does is it lightens the mood a little bit. But also suddenly this ogre, this feeling, this overwhelming feeling, which is about you being wrong in many cases, you know, that feeling that I'm wrong, I shouldn't feel like this, suddenly becomes this thing that you can manage. I can see it now. You know, it's, it's, it's a red box or it's, it's a blue triangle. Or... And the other interesting thing that happens is as you chat around, just talking about the shape. So let's assume that this anger I'm talking about here in my shoulders feels like, um, let's see, a green stick. It feels like a green stick stuck in my shoulders, okay? So the way I would use that little analogy is I would say, even though I had this green stick of anger stuck in my shoulders, I'm okay. And I'm tapping on the side of my hand as I do that because that's my setup phrase. Talked about what I've got, now I've said I'm okay. Next thing is I tap the top of my head, this green stick in my shoulders, between the eyes, this green stick, side of the eye, stuck in my shoulders, under the eye, this green stick, under the nose, green stick, stuck in my shoulders, under the mouth, this green stick, collarbone point, this green stick in my shoulders. Take a breath. Now, focus in and notice what's happened to your shape and its color. So very often it changes. And maybe the stick, 
I mean, obviously I'm just making this up as I go along, but you know, the, if, if it were a stick, what might happen is it would get shorter or it would start to feel like it was made of rubber. It was a bit more bendy. Sometimes it gets bigger. Sometimes it becomes heavier. So where you put your attention, sometimes it grows. And again, I would caution you, be aware that that might happen. It's absolutely okay if it does, but that's why we move gently with this because sometimes things feel worse before they feel better. And that again, that's a little response that your brain does to keep you safe because you're thinking about something that was deeply hurtful, possibly even physically painful. You know, it doesn't want you going back there. So it says, oh, no, no, don't think about that. Look, it's going to be really, really scary. The, the opposite of that is very often, if I say to a client, what color is it? They'll say, oh, it's turquoise blue and I love turquoise blue and I don't want this horrible thing that happened to be associated with my favorite color. And I say to them, well, look, let's just go with that color because I'm pretty certain that we'll see something happen to that color as we start. And usually what happens is by the time we've had done the setup phrase and I said something like, even though I had this beautiful turquoise blue circle resting on my heart or whatever it is, we'll get to the top of the head point side of the eye and the client you can see that in their face and I say what are you noticing ah oh, it's not turquoise anymore it's muddy brown and so it's almost as if our subconscious tries to give it to us in a more palatable form to start with you know oh, you like that turquoise blue okay it's a terrible problem but let's make it look a bit pretty to start with and then when you get working on it all of a sudden it shows its true colors so I don't know am I making sense with all of this yeah, I like the color and the and the shape thing. That's really mm. neat to be able to to to, to, to see the emotion in, in that, that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it works for lots of people. There are some people who don't see in colors and shapes in that way, and they find that quite challenging. And that's fine. That's just the way your brain works. And I use numbers or I, I use things like suitcases and bags. You know, if it, if it were a bag, how big would it be? What sort of, you know, and for some people, it's a shipping container, you know. So you can use all sorts of ways to make, a, make an object, um, like a tangible thing of this feeling that you have and do what works for you. For some people, it's just been a ruler and the ruler has got longer or shorter depending on, on what we're working on and what stage we're at you know, or a clock face or, you know, so you go with the way that you think. And if you're a very, um, if you're a person who can think in abstracts, then that's great. And, you know, if you're a person who finds color and shape really interesting and easy to work with, or if you're a person who enjoys numbers, you know, they all work. It's just a way of what it's, what it's doing really, Sarah, is allowing you to use both your left and your right sides of your brain to work out a problem. And so we're not just stuck in that left side, that problem-solving analytical side. We're, we're forcing the more creative elements of our brain to come in and help solve this problem. Yeah. And can I just ask a question about so why at certain points or maybe if under the bra, like why do sometimes that people don't like that point being, being touched, being tapped on? Yeah. Okay. So my experience of this is... So for instance, I can use me as a good example. I love the top of the head point. If I'm feeling a little bit sluggish, I just tap that point and it's like, woo, off I go. I get the endorphin rush straight away, which feels like really pleasant um, tingling washing down over my shoulders. And it's a, it's a great calming and also rejuvenating point for me. It feels good. I don't enjoy the underarm point very much. It just doesn't feel good. It hurts a little bit when I tap on it. And so I like to leave that point out. Um, there's another point that's very effective and it's called the gamut point. And you'll find that on the back of your hand and it's in the little point um, between your ring finger and your little finger. It's about maybe three centimeters in. I have to use that one very sparingly because I feel quite sick. It can make me feel really like I'm going to be ill if I press on that other people love it but for me it's a brilliant one to use if I am on a boat trip and I get seasick mm -hmm. but other times I can't you know I just can't use it whereas other people love it that's their go-to when they're feeling stressed so I think it's about the way our own bodies react and the own energy that we've got in our bodies and the way that we react to it 
for some people the face men I find particularly they don't enjoy tapping on their face particularly under the eye they will avoid that one and, and often I'll watch them backing away from their own fingers so you know that's why I say you can leave out a point mm -hmm. so I think some of it will be about just culturally which is a where is a good place to tap and also physically for you if you have any injuries I mean obviously I've worked with some women who've had mastectomies and tapping even on the collarbone point and particularly under the arm you know around the breast area and lymph node area it's not comfortable for them and so you just work with with the areas that feel good what you'll find is if you just think or notice what do I do when I feel a bit stressed do I do I rub my chin do I put my hand up to the side of my ear? Am I inclined to rub my hands together? You know, think about what you do naturally and then gravitate towards those. I've, I've worked with people where we've just used the hands. There are lots of points on the hands you can use. Very effective just to squeeze the bed of each nail with the thumb and forefinger of the other hand. So you just squeeze rhythmically the bed of each fingernail on each side of your finger. I don't know if that really translates to uh, yeah, audio. Yeah, in, in massages yeah. where they just yeah, order, they it. pull the finger or they, yeah, they, they squeeze yeah. the fingernail and it somehow, it is very relaxing. Well, the point, the meridian end point, end point is actually on the inside of each nail. So hmm. if you look at your hand, the point is the, um, at the bottom of the nail towards the inside where it meets the next finger, if you like. So that's quite hard to tap on. But if you squeeze or pinch the ends of it, you want to do it quite um, firmly. You don't want to hurt mm -hmm. yourself, but you want to see a little bit of, of white come up in your finger now, you know, so that you're getting a little bit of contact there. Another really lovely thing to do, particularly if you're, if you're working with someone. So often if people are very, very overwhelmed, it's nice to be able to do EFT on them, but you don't want to be as intrusive as tapping on their face or on their body, but you can take their hand and you can just swipe or wipe, if you like, the palm of your hand over the back of their hand and do it in a rhythmic way. So it's almost like you're drawing a square or rectangle over the top of the back of their hand, if that makes sense. And it's it's a lovely thing to do. Um, it's something that they do quite often for elderly patients, particularly in dementia wards, because it has that lovely sense of connection and you can rub hand cream in like that and you know, you're just, just getting, you're just stimulating those points, getting a connection without any sort of intrusive touch. And what about after when you do it and you've, I've felt kind of this sort of this buzzy little feeling or tingling. Yeah. Finish the session. So what's happening there? Well, that's wonderful that you're feeling. And that's just endorphin release. It's that lovely chemical release that you get. I mean, that's what I talked about, that feeling. I get like a little wash going down over my shoulders. So it's deep relaxation. It's your brain giving you the opposite to the cortisol and adrenaline that, the adrenaline that it, it normally gives you for that stress response, that fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, the psychological blocks that we talked about in the beginning? So things that you've, you've personally dealt with there, you, well, you've, you work and help with a lot of people doing, going through repeat miscarriage, traumatic birth. How do those, and even hidden blocks, a lot of women have come to me and say they've, they might've, I don't know, they may have somehow heard something and somehow it's it's stuck in them that they won't be a mother or th things like that how does EFT help yeah so as we've talked about that you know gently it unravels things and sometimes there are feelings that are hidden away behind others one of the ways to to find a hidden block and because they are hidden is to think about all of the things you say to yourself so you would start off this is quite a good exercise if you're into writing things down and you like to see things in front of you so get yourself a pen and big piece of paper and think of drawing a tabletop and on top of the table would be the problem that you have and so a very general problem would be I can't get pregnant or, or whatever that problem is that you're saying to yourself so think about what do I say most often put it on top of the, the table so you draw a line and put that on the table and then you're going to draw legs down from that line so this is why I say it's a table and I, I didn't invent this technique, but it's, it's a wonderful way of starting to map out what's going on for you. And then on each leg, and you might have many legs on this table, you write down every time you heard or thought or saw something that supported that belief that you have, I can't get pregnant. 
because actually what you're telling yourself is it's a belief. So you might be saying, I can't get pregnant as a fact, but in many cases, it's a belief. And so if one of your legs on your table is, I can't get pregnant and physically you can't because you, you don't, you know, you've had a hysterectomy or something. Well, that's the stopping point, isn't it? I mean, I mean, that's the truth. But if, if that's not the case, if there are other things going on, then it's time to start looking behind. Why do I have this belief? What's, what's giving me this belief? So it may be I've had three miscarriages or it may be my aunt never, couldn't have a baby or maybe that I know my mum took a long time before she conceived me. And so you start thinking of all the things that feed into the story of I can't get pregnant. If you know that it's not to do with, um, with a physical problem, then you know that so, so, so far you've been told that you have everything that you need to conceive and carry a baby, but it's just not happening. And you start writing them down. And I, I would say stop. If you get more than 10, stop. Because it's too many to be working with. And what you'll probably find is that two of the, two of the incidences or the memories or the stories that, back that, that sort of feed into this, I can't get pregnant, are probably the same thing. And then you start looking through those and see if there's a common thread. And you, would, you could tap on each of those, so everything that comes up. So let's say I can't get pregnant is, is your general problem that you feel you have. And, and the one that's causing you the most stress. And the reason, one of the reasons or the beliefs you have behind that is that, well, it took my mum a long time before she conceived me. And so what that might start to do is chip away with this, I can't get pregnant, but, but maybe I can, but maybe it's going to take a long time. So then it starts to change. Or maybe you've got these two beliefs going on. I can't get pregnant and it's going to take me a long time to get pregnant. And then you think to yourself, okay, which is the biggest problem? Which is the one I believe the most? If I was to measure this out of 10, it's going to take me a long time. Zero to 10, how true is that? Or the other one, I can't get pregnant. Zero to 10, how true is that? So it starts to help you get a perspective here. And the psychological blocks start to unravel themselves. You start to, you can, can you see already with me talking, you've, you've started to backtrack on this. I can't get pregnant, but you've realized, well, my mom got pregnant, did take her a long time. Maybe that's what's going to happen to me. So you start to shift this belief. And then you can look at that again, this belief, well, it took my mom a long time to get pregnant. Therefore, it will take me a long time. Why? Again, tabletop it's going to take me a long time to get pregnant every leg. How do I know this? Do I have proof? Has a doctor told me this because of my anatomy? This is what's going to happen. You know, you could start looking at all the reasons why you believe that. And it is a process. And you might find that what you do is that you have, you start with one belief and you think, oh, actually, that's not really what's going on here. And you throw it away. And then you come back to the next one and you throw it away. And it's, a, it's, a, it's slow, but it should be a slow process. And just allow yourself to write down and explore all the thoughts that come up because psychological blocks are not really real. They're not real things. We think they are, but they're just thoughts. There is, there is no real psychological block unless we make it a block. And everything everything that you come up with, there can be some way around that problem. There's some way of not necessarily immediately becoming pregnant, but in changing your perception of what you believe you can have or what are you worthy of. And, and sometimes that's what it comes down to. You know, you start thinking about for instance, let's take this, you know, my mum took a long time to get pregnant, therefore it will take me a long time to get pregnant. So hidden behind that might be, I don't work properly. My body is failing me. I'm wrong. And if you've got those little beliefs going on underneath, they will get in the way of anything else because it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. If you go to a doctor and he says, there's nothing physically stopping you from getting pregnant, but you've got in your mind the sort, but I'm wrong, then it will start to get in the way of anything you do. It will start to challenge 
any other information that's given to you and it may even stop you from trying some of the things that have been suggested to you like change of diet like losing weight like exercise like taking hormone replacements like I don't know or any and all of the things that might actually have a direct and satisfactory result for you I do like that tabletop. I've, I wrote it down here as you were talking <laughs> and the legs and all the different pieces. Cause sometimes as we, and you say to, to not have any more than 10, but yeah, as you unravel this and dig deeper, right? Sometimes the thing we say the first isn't quite, may not always be what it is. And if you go a little further, go a little further, and then you can use EFT to tap on, on each of these, these points, just kind of teasing it, teasing it apart. And then, yeah, really all about perspective and shifting that and looking at things maybe a little differently. Yeah, I mean, if, it, if, if we take the whole pregnancy thing and this, I want to be pregnant or I can't get pregnant, that's almost a bit like saying I can't be happy. Well, there are lots of reasons or lots of ways that people feel happy and everybody is different. And it's the same thing with that pregnancy. It's a bit of a too broad a statement to start with. And that's where the overwhelm comes in as well, because you feel like you have nothing you can do about it. You haven't stripped it down to, to its bare bones, that belief that you have that's become a truth for you. So yeah, I, I love the tabletop for that. And also because it's all there in front of you, it gives you the opportunity then to, to get that muddle out of your head of all the things that are going around all the time. And also what I'll often do with clients is I'll say, okay, well, we've got 10 things there. That's a lot. And I can see that you want to put more on there, but we're going to stop right now. And then we can be quite acknowledging and accepting of those and say, and, and also honoring of the fact that this is a, a worry for this client. And you say, I understand those things are a worry for you. We're going to come back to them later. We won't ignore them. We'll come back to them. Right now, which of these is the one that you think you would like to work on the most? And there, there's a wonderful relief in only having to work on one thing at a time. And I mean, we, we all know this it doesn't matter what you're doing. I mean, I've just moved house, you know, and it was overwhelming at first, all the boxes there. And we had to just say, okay, one room and the boxes for one room, let's get one room straight. And then at least we've got a place we can go into and breathe. And it's the same with, a, with any problem. You break it down into its smaller pieces and you fix them, you fix the thing that in some cases is easiest and quickest to fix first, or that seems to be the most pressing. Mm -hmm. And how many sessions, I guess it's going to vary, but how many sessions would you say typically? Yeah, I mean, and then that is very difficult to say. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, how long is a piece of string? But mm -hmm. I find typically that six sessions is more than enough. So usually I work with clients over the space of two months. And we have six sessions over that um, time and also little power check-ins in between as well. And they have to do a little bit of homework. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it, it's not really. And that's enough then to, to really start unraveling what's hidden and to send them off so that they can feel empowered to do it for themselves. You know, that's, that's what I'm all about really is that I, I want them to go away and be able to do it for themselves, to be able to then the next time, the next little thing comes up and we're always going to have the next little thing mm -hmm. as it's unravels and it unravels, but that they feel equipped to be able to manage. And then what will happen sometimes is they'll call me maybe eight months later and say, I've been doing really well, but now I've got stuck on this one little thing. Could you help me see where I'm getting stuck? Because we're very good, me included, at not really hearing what we're saying and tapping around the problem, but not actually on the thing itself. So, you know, then they'll come back for just one session with me. But, but usually, and in most cases, if I'm working with people for um, long-term PTSD or trauma-related anxiety, with stories that are there that they, they feel they just can't let go of and that are impacting their life now, then I sign them up for the two month package to start with. And then, you know, I mean, sometimes we can be done and dusted in three sessions and that's great. And then I say, well, that's wonderful. Here's your money back and off you go. And that's wonderful that that's worked for you, you know, and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. But I, I offer a, a series of different packages to, to suit everybody because sometimes people just want to put a lid on it quickly for something they've got to do. And then one session works. If you want to put a lid on it, one session or we might have a month session which is a month package rather which is three sessions and that might be for something where they want to really get started themselves but they feel that the problem is not 
traumatizing enough that, that they feel happy to go off and, and work with it themselves. And yeah, so it really depends on the person and, and how long, well, not how long they've had the problem as much as, as what they feel has caused it and how comfortable they feel on doing the work for themselves. And what about a, a book or a website or an app? What are, what, any, what's any recommendations there for us? That yeah, like? so there is just loads and loads of stuff out there. I would say, I mean, my training for emotional freedom technique came through the gold standard training that Gary Craig developed. And I'm a member of ARMET and ASEP. And so I like to stick to the training, the EFT training that comes from both of those bodies. So ARMET is double A-M-E-T and it's... Um, I won't, it's an acronym, I won't give you the, the words it stands for, and ASAP the same, but you can find great information from both of those sites. Also go to the, anything to do with Gary Craig on YouTube, you can find lots of general information about using emotional freedom technique. Uh, my website as well, I'm still developing that as a resource for um, clients to come to. I've, I've, up until now, I've been um, exclusively a local practice and so it's quite exciting for me now to be taking this online and working with people and part of my relocation it's it's been a choice i've made to do a lot of online coaching as well so i'm changing the website so that'll be a great resource center as well i have some books on there that people can download and just gives you a little bit of help on getting started with using emotional freedom technique to unravel some of what you're feeling or helping you just feel a little bit calmer a little bit better before you tackle whatever it is you've got to go and do next you know so perhaps if after a miscarriage and you're feeling ready to start again and try for another baby but you'd like to feel a little bit more emotionally strong so yeah I think in terms of pregnancy support I haven't found anywhere that I could suggest to you that you go to other than myself at the minute people who are using emotional freedom technique specifically for pregnancy related issues but there's lots of people doing it for trauma work Mm -hmm. great so uh, gary craig so is it c-r-a-i-g that's it yeah yeah Yeah. and then um double a m e t is that a a website that so yes double a m e t on it okay great so let's just share a if you can share a success story uh with us i think my greatest success is the work i did on myself and it was after losing my first baby and I, I lost my son at 25 weeks. I delivered him and I was able to hold him afterwards and the midwife took a photo and this photo became, it became like a, a talisman. It became a really, it became far more important than it ever should have done really. It, it should have been a lovely reminder and it became more of a, um, it sort of drew me back into that terrible time but I felt I couldn't get rid of it. And I didn't know, I didn't know quite how to honor it and look after it. And the longer the time went on, it became more important that I kept it, but I kept it hidden. I didn't want other people to find it. And I certainly didn't want my children to find it. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I couldn't bear to get rid of it. And so it moved with us to New Zealand and then it moved back to England again. And and then I brought the photo again with me here. And I used to keep it in a special box and I was always thinking about it. It was like it wouldn't leave my mind. It was almost like a post-traumatic stress response, really, to to what had happened, but it was tied into this photograph that I had in the box. And so I decided that I wanted to do something honoring with this photo because after my son was born, I was very sick and I wasn't able to go to a little Thanksgiving ceremony that um, been had been organized by the hospital so that we could grieve. And it was almost like having a little funeral, really. And so I always felt like I hadn't been able to, to really grieve and let go and that maybe I could do that around this photograph. And at the time, thought of doing anything with that photograph, you know, burying it or, or anything, I just couldn't bear to let go of it because somehow it meant letting go of the, the little boy that I lost. And so I started working through this um, feeling that I had around it, this tie to it, this emotional attachment to the photograph, the fear that I had of my children finding it. And I mean, I talked openly with them about the fact that I'd, I'd lost a baby before they were born, but it wasn't, it wasn't a photo I felt I could share with them for some reason and show them. It was too precious. And 
so I knew that wasn't really a healthy way to feel about it. And so what I did with the emotional freedom technique is I worked through all of the attachment and what came up for me was a lot of anger about the way people had treated me at the time, the way that they had talked about this child that I had in my arms as just being a thing that probably it was just as well that I had lost him. And you know that, and for me at that time, they were dreadful, dreadful things to hear. And I'd held on to anger and bitterness about them that had grown over time. And to cut this long story short, because it did take time of unraveling, eventually I was able to have a wonderful ceremony where I cremated, if you like, the photo. Mm. But more importantly for me, what happened was, instead of losing something, I actually gained almost in a great rush this ability to think about giving birth to that little baby, the way the lovely midwife had dealt with me at the time. And also, I just remembered the joy and the excitement of being pregnant with him and the way that we had felt. And that was something that I hadn't had when I became pregnant with my second child, with my son, because I was so afraid we were going to lose him. And so in some ways, that second pregnancy had been marred, if you like, by the loss of the first baby. And suddenly what seemed to happen was the joy of being pregnant caught up with what had actually been a very successful pregnancy with the birth of my second child and and became one. And I had this feeling of the baby that I had lost being with me, that I could think about him and think about what happened. And it's part of my life, but it it then went into the past rather than being with me all the time, every day. I mean, I, this has gone on for a very long time. You know, my, my son was seven by this point. So that was eight years of carrying this feeling around, this very heavy feeling, this burden. And suddenly I was able to give up the burden, but just keep the joy and the memory of it and forgive people who had said what they said and understand that they said it because they didn't know what else to say they were trying to be helpful you know and even the people who at the time were were not trying to be helpful they were just busy medical professionals and they were just you know they were just getting on with their day and I was just another person and I was even able to put all of that into perspective and so for me it was a wonderful release and relief but also I gained so much from it and I think for me that that would be my, one of my well, one of my greatest successes because I can measure that every day, how I feel about that and what it's brought to my life to have been able to do that. But I know from the clients I've worked with, others have, I can think of a, a lady particularly who had, had had a successful delivery, but it was a very traumatic delivery. It had not gone the way that she had expected. And she had been, a lot of medical intervention at the end, all, all necessary for the successful delivery of her baby. And just as importantly for her to have um, delivered and, and been safe and really saved her life but it wasn't what she was expecting and that's where the trauma came from she had planned her birth plan was a water birth with music playing and her mum there and what actually transpired was a very quick and emergency delivery and she couldn't move on from that and she was stuck in the trauma of that that it was all going wrong and that somehow she had created that and the thought of having another child, even though her, her partner was very keen and supportive, she'd always said she wanted more than one child. She couldn't go through that again. Yeah, so, and as a result of working together, she's been able to, to really make sense of what happened, to be at peace with herself to a large degree, except that it's what had to happen for her to safely deliver the child that she has now. And she's been able to go back to a midwife and talk about how she can plan for her next pregnancy. So she, she doesn't have another baby yet and she's not pregnant yet, but she's been able to open herself up to the possibility now that she can have another baby, that, that what she wanted was to have two children and that is possible for her and she can take control of that. And for her, what it was, was this lack of control. The whole, everything was out of her control all of a sudden. And that's in, in many ways what hurt the most. That was scary. And so she's been able to bring back in the element of control by now talking to people, going and talking to the people who had delivered her, her baby the first time 
and talk about why that happened. And she wasn't able to even think about what had happened before because it, it actually created a physical sensation. She had physical pain when she thought about the delivery that had, had in her mind gone wrong. And so we were able to separate out the physical pain that she felt, which was actually um, a psychological response and was making her tense up. And then she's been able to go and talk to people. So, you know, that for me, that's a success as well. That's empowering people to now go on and make a new decision. And, and whether she chooses to have another baby or not, that's up to her. But now she has that choice back. And I think for me, success if, is if I get from somebody that I'm working with that sense that they now feel they have a choice again about how they feel, about what they do, and about how they go forward. Yeah, first of all, your story is just so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's very personal and yeah, just an amazing story. And I, I thank you so much for sharing that. And, and also the one with a traumatic birth, I have many women come to me as well with that's kind of, they've had traumatic births and that is kind of yeah, locked in them and, ca and causing issues with them trying for the second one. So again, another really powerful story that you share with us there. And you've got a free booklet. You talked about it a little bit, but I just wanted to, if you could share a little bit more about this booklet that you're, you're offering here. It's for people that are I guess, struggling with miscarriage or there's another one you said, uh, helping your partners. Maybe you share a little bit about that and where they can get that booklet. Yeah, okay. So um, you'll find everything over on the resources page at my website. Um, I'll give you the um, link to that in a minute. But effectively, I've just got a little resource library of, of um booklets that help in different ways and so one of the what, what I've done is created this in response to the conversations I have with clients and one of the things that comes up the most is the way people have spoken to them or not spoken to them after they've had a miscarriage or after they've had a difficult delivery and, and they want to say yes I that either I've got this lovely baby but you know it didn't go the way I wanted and I'm I can't get over that and you can't talk about that they said but nobody wants to talk about it they go to antenatal or they go to postnatal groups and people are all talking about how lovely it was and wonderful and some people might talk about you know a little bit about some, something going wrong but there's no trauma nobody wants to know about trauma or terrible um scary deliveries and they, they feel they can't express how it went for them and also people who've lost a baby, had a miscarriage, people who don't talk to them, people who say the wrong thing, people who say things like, oh, never mind, you can have another baby. Never mind, you can try again. Oh, never mind, it was only three weeks. It was just a bunch of cells, you know, and all of these things which cut them to the, to the core and they wish that people had said something different. And so I thought it would be wonderful to have a booklet for people who are, who are going to visit someone who's just had a miscarriage, things to say and things not to say because it's very difficult, you know, and you can look at it from the, the other person's point of view as well. It's, it's very hard to know what to say, but we, we all need to really step over that. We need to step over it. And it's not about us. It's about what does this person who's just suffered a loss need right now? And so that booklet is about that. And also the women that I, I mean, I work with couples, but often the women will say, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what it's like. He thinks we should just start again. He thinks, and this difference between the way often the male brain looks at this. I mean, there's sadness, you know, we lost a baby, but let's make another baby. It's a problem that needs to be solved by making another baby. Whereas the, the, the woman is often, but I didn't just lose a pregnancy. I actually lost this child. I was dressing it in a school uniform, you know, and so for them, the grieving is, is bigger in terms of what they have lost. It's a different type of grieving. It's so, when I say it's bigger, I don't mean they grieve more. I mean, they have more that they are thinking about and bringing into the picture rather than just with, with the men, it often just seems to be, oh, you mean that we've got to go through that all again. We've got to do that again. That's, you know, I, I'd really got used to that idea. And it's the, the language is different and what they what they are, what they have lost and what they're grieving tends to be different. And so I thought it would be useful for partners to be able to see it from a different perspective as well, so that you know the right things to say. And also, you know, when anniversaries come up, anniversary of loss, and, you know, it could be that for the rest of your life, you remember that the baby you lost was born in April. And so at the end of April, that becomes 
not a sad time, but you just remember it. You just remember it. And you, you would like to be able to say to your partner, oh, it's April, you know, and they know, they know what that means. And it doesn't mean that you need to, to have any special flowers or celebration or anything, but you just want to be able to share that you're thinking that, you know, the more that you feel you have to keep inside, the more difficult. So that's what these resources are about. And, and lastly, I have a, a booklet that just helps you get started with using emotional freedom technique to address how you're feeling, to think about what might be going on under the surface. And I'm, I'm not really into tapping scripts. I believe they have a place, but the way that we all deal with what's coming up for us, the way that we hide what we're really feeling, you know, it's very different, very specific. And so my booklets tend to be more about how you might use the words that are coming to you rather than giving you a script to work through. But I, I do give some sample scripts in there so that you can see how you might use the language, just as we've done today as we've talked. Be sure to check out Diana's website at yourpregnancystory.com. So that's yourpregnancystory.com. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on today, Diana, and sharing your, you know, your words of wisdom and running us through an EFT uh, session. I found this talk very uh, informative and very, very powerful. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've absolutely enjoyed it. It's, it's just been a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a U.S. resident, text FERTILE to 345-345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20-minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. So for U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.yogafreebie.com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Hey there, Sarah Clark here. So are you struggling to have your baby? First of all, please know that my heart goes out to you. I support couples worldwide who are struggling with infertility to conceive and have healthy babies. Women like Rita, who gave birth to her beautiful daughter after following my fertility coaching system. Or Danielle, who after two failed IUIs was able to get pregnant after a supercharger fertility discovery call with me. So here's how you get my help for free. So I offer a free supercharger fertility discovery call. And on that call, I'll create a plan with you that is going to help you fast track your success. So this call is not for everyone. And I'm really picky about who I get to speak with. And I have a strict but totally reasonable criteria that needs to be met in order for us to move forward. So here's who I can help. So first of all, you need to be able to explore your infertility diagnosis in a new light. So this offers for people who are open-minded, they're coachable, and if, you, and if you can do that and want to double or triple your chances at the fertility clinic or get pregnant, awesome. So let's get on the phone and chat. Also, you must be an action taker. So someone who's committed to seeing results, you're able to follow directions. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do anything bizarre. But if you're one of those people who like to consume a ton of information, but don't like to spend time implementing and seeing results, then the call's not really for you. So I only want to spend time with people who are genuinely committed to their own success. So just click on the link in the show notes and apply, or go to fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on the free consult. So it's a really short application that just tells me about your health, how long you've been trying to conceive, and how soon you like to be pregnant. So seriously, this is going to be the best time you've ever spent on your fertility. Looking forward to chatting. Talk soon.